I have been thinking about some things recently, and I thought I'd think out loud with you, so maybe you can walk out of here thinking also. I sometimes stop at a McDonald's to get a tea first before I get to the office, and sometimes I'll get a biscuit, something else to eat. Maybe I go through the drive through at times and eat it on the road or eat it here in my office, and sometimes I'll even sit down there and eat or drink or maybe even read while I do that. And at one of the nearby McDonald's, I regularly see, regularly see a group of men, an older group of men who sit at a table and talk, and they love to talk, shoot the breeze, tell some stories, think about the issues of the day like older men like to do. And on this one morning back in November, I was sitting at a table right by them, my back to them, and this group of older men, and I'm aware I am now an older man, but they were older than me. They were talking, three of them on this day, talking, and I got to hear what they were saying, and it interested me, so I eavesdropped a little bit, paid attention, came back and wrote some things down. Uh, I was interested to hear their topic of the morning, at least for a while, was churches and Christians, and they didn't have good things to say. They had some experiences, some memories, they, some explanations of why I guess they didn't think very highly of some Christians and churches. I think maybe one of them might have gone to a church, was more quiet than the others, I think, if I could remember right. I guessed and I assumed some things. I put some pieces together. I don't even know which ones were talking and which stories were which man's. I just remember hearing them and how put off they were by some of their experiences. And I thought I'd share some of those with you. Here are some of their stories. One man said he and his wife went to a big church down in Dallas, just to visit. Some Texas friends had invited them to go with them, urged them to go, so they went. He and his wife finally got there on Sunday, pulled up, still in the parking lot, getting ready to go in the building, and they witnessed their pastor or preacher getting out of his limo to enter the building. It didn't sit well with them. About halfway through the service, he said they passed the plates, as we did this morning, and got their money. Later in the service, a man got up and told the crowd, we didn't get enough money, so we're passing the plates again. And they watched as a young mother sitting near them had already given the first time the plates were passed. She put some money in there. But this time, she got out a checkbook and wrote a check. And they guessed, him and his wife guessed she didn't have a lot by looking at her, assumed she'd already used the grocery money to cover her food for her kids. And now she was giving even more to a church that already had a lot of money. One man said he had some neighbors. They were new to the area. The neighbors came over to introduce themselves one day, and right after they did that, they asked if they were saved. And he said in that conversation he believed in God. He didn't know what he meant. they meant by saved. Anyway, they were obviously Christian people who weren't shy about saying it, and at some point later, he said, they sued us over the fence line. Nice, I think he said, nice. One man mentioned working for a law office, and a, a man came by their law office and telling the story and saying he needed counsel, and he wanted that man's company to represent him in court and kept telling them, I'm a good Christian man, you know, I'm a good Christian man. And the company did their due diligence, he said. They researched him and his case and decided just to pass, just to pass on it. Didn't want to take that up, represent him. And he said at the table at McDonald's, said, soon after that, we saw him in the local paper. Him and some others were having some sex parties with underage girls. And the man at McDonald's said, some kind of Christian. There's another story about a so-called Christian out driving one day, ran into a ditch. This man had stopped to help him, discovered he was drunk, and gave him some advice, I guess, helped him get on the road on his way. I don't know. And then the last story, one man said his last straw with church was when his mother, I think it was his mother, was dying. And on her deathbed at home, a minister dropped by the house, a minister from a local church dropped by to come and be with her and pray for her. And the husband, I assume this man's dad now, heard the man saying, I will pray for her, but then he suggested a specific amount of money to give to the church. 
And that is when the words were given to the man of God, get the bleep off of our property. Five stories from three men in a McDonald's. And I I wonder what they wonder. And I think I know. I mean, they would like to ask, I think, is the church all about money? Is that all they care about? Is, Is the church one big show? No depth of truth, no concern for others. Um, are Christians really fake? Are they just playing a charade? Church just full of big old hypocrites? I would like to answer those questions. I think I have a good answer for those questions, but does the world know the answer to those questions? I don't know all the reasons why Christians have been misunderstood and attacked and persecuted and hated through the centuries. But I know it has been true, and it is true, and it always will be true, that it happens. Even when we intend to do right, even when we try our best to love God the most and be ambassadors for Jesus, to to represent Him well in the world around us, it doesn't always turn out well for us. And while hatred towards Jesus' followers seems to be, seems to be ramping up in our own country, I am very aware, while we might notice that, and it might get a little harder for us, there are people today in other countries who are being persecuted and who could lose their lives because of their faith in Jesus. But again, why? Why do people hate us sometimes? I had done a little web surfing on this, and you can do it too. You can find your own answers. I, I was interested to find people who just boldly said, I hate Christians, I hate the church, and it's interesting, some of those people would call themselves Christians and grew up in church and have come to despise us and this. One girl on Reddit wrote, I grew up with Christianity forced down my throat 24-7. We had to go to church one or two times a week for service and almost every single day for other activities. I think, I think she's exaggerating. Everyone there, both adults and kids alike, traumatized me in some way, and they were always so high and mighty about it, too. She kept writing and spewing hate and explaining why she hated all those folks and ended with this. Anyway, sorry for the rant, but nobody else that I know hates Christianity as much as I do, and maybe none of you do either, but I really just had to get it off my chest tonight after I saw some ugly wannabe IG influencer neglecting her kids but praising her God in the same post. Someone else posted on Reddit asked, why do people seem to hate the concept of Christianity and Christians so much? And one response, she got a lot, one response was, going to be honest, 99% of all the hate I've received in my life and 100% of the most extreme hate has been from Christians. I don't even hate Christianity. In fact, I find it fascinating. Seems Christians get even angrier at me when they learn that. I've learned I've learned, she said, that it's best not to talk with Christians about Christianity, and I've stopped doing it. Interesting. I think there's some exaggeration in some of these. The person goes on to explain more and then says, because I grew up a Christian surrounded by Christians, and every single Christian I know is the most mean, judgmental person. I don't even know who she's hanging around. I know there are some nice people, but the Christians I know actively push me away from religion with their superiority complex for being more devout than anyone and thought they were literally being God on earth, probably because so many of them are utter and complete beep during the week and pray for forgiveness on a Sunday and then continue to be beep the next week. I have never, I have never met a non-judgmental Christian. I think I want to introduce some of these folks to some of you. I don't know who they're hanging around. Uh, One more random post just to hit it home. I absolutely cannot stand Christians. I hate having friends who are super Christians. I hate having to listen to Christian music, and I hate going to church. Maybe some of you feel like that too. I feel like a harlot, she said, which I'm not. Every time I walk into one, I think devotionals are expletive. I can't stand having to be around super Christian people because I feel like I have to act proper around them. When one of my roommates forces me to go to church, I don't even know who this is or what they're doing. I I feel looked down upon and preached to. The funny thing is, though, that I actually consider myself Christian. And there's more to say, but I won't tell y'all. I don't know. I don't know. I wonder if 
some of these folks have just been around, around the wrong kind of Christians and churches. But, but maybe, just maybe, some of these posts say more about the person posting than the people who are trying to influence them. Because I, I think if there, if there was somebody, and I don't know all of you today, I'm not trying to be cruel, but if, if somebody came in here and, and that person was actively sinning, enjoying sinning, I think they would also maybe feel a little uncomfortable in here, maybe put off by some of the comments, maybe feel judged or preached to, maybe. The truth is the gospel is still, as Paul said back in 1 Corinthians 1, a, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. We are a long way from Jesus in Paul's day, but there are still folks today in our midst, in our world, who take exception to gospel, to the gospel, to people who preach the gospel and try to live it out. Some won't like it, ever. Some will reject it, always. Some will hate it and those who believe it or speak of it. And if we continue to speak about Jesus and call sin, sin, and tell people there is a hell and it is coming, the message will not be appreciated, I know, by all. But still, we'll speak of the truth no matter what. And even if we speak of the truth, I know some will hate it and some will hate us. Luke Smith doesn't live here in the U.S. Back in 2011, he posted about going to college for the first time as a Christian. And he determined, I really want to tell people, I want to be up front with them about it, about me being a Christian. And he said the day he moved into his dorm, he said hello to his brand new roommate, never met him before. The man replied, the young man, hello in return. And his next words were, I've just had a flyer put under my door from the beep Christians. I hate Christians. And he wrote, in that moment, I had a life-changing decision to make. And I could feel my heart beating as I plucked up the courage to say, well, that's awkward because I am a Christian. He says, a cringeworthy silence followed, and he said, fair enough, and we changed the subject, and later that evening, he moved out of the hall as he said he couldn't live with a Christian. Maybe we are the problem. Maybe there's a reason why we're hated. And, and maybe some hate us before they even know us, before, before we've opened our mouth, only with a hello, and here comes the hatred. I know this, the hatred really shouldn't surprise us that much. When Jesus was trying to prepare his own disciples before he died and, and when he would go, and in John 15 he told him, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. There's part of the problem. But as it is, he said, you do not belong to the world. I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. I, I guess it should be no surprise to us, although it is, I think, that sometimes the world does not love us and will hate us, even when we try to do our best. Maybe it's because the gospel itself can be offensive. Jesus' claim, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man gets to the Father except through me. That's exclusive. That can be offensive. Truth can hurt when it is spoken, especially when people would rather not hear it and are repelled by it. When light is shown into the darkness, as John, John 1 describes it, don't expect the darkness to love it. And when we say that Scripture says some of these truths like God is God and there is no other, Jesus is the only name given to man by which we must be saved. The wages of sin is death. Sinners who continue in sin cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Well, that's offensive. And it is. The gospel sometimes, the scripture sometimes, the truth sometimes is offensive. I just want to be sure that we are not being offensive in how we speak. Paul wrote, speak the truth in love. And I believe that, all of that. We sometimes are good at speaking the truth. But speaking the truth in love is sometimes a challenge. And even when we speak, and we should speak as we should speak in truth, 
Let's be sure we're speaking in love because be assured of this, God loves every sinner and wants every sinner, us and them and all of them to be saved. Back to the question, then what do we do? How do we respond? First, let's do good even when it doesn't turn out well for us. The end goal is not so much for others to understand us or value us or treat us well. The ultimate goal is for God to get the glory. So no matter what happens to me, what happens to us, if God gets the glory, we should be pleased. 1 Peter 2, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, it still surprises me that Christians who are trying to love God and love others too are thought of as being the greatest haters in this world. I'm shocked. But live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, maybe they would see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. No matter what happens to me, what happens to us, God should get the glory. If he gets the glory, then we'll be pleased. Even if it kills us, if he gets the glory, we'll be pleased. Live well. Do all you can to see that God gets the glory. Maybe it won't happen, but still, do it anyway. Live wisely among the world. Treat them well. Be attentive to their needs. When you interact, speak well. Make the most of every single conversation and opportunity. Speak when given a chance. Speak the truth in love. Be ready to season your speech with grace, always with grace, so that your language is flowing in it and overflowing with it. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's not original with me. Paul's words to the Colossian Christians was this. Be wise. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. So look for opportunities. Make the most of this week, every second of this day. When we can influence someone, do it. When can you speak the truth and it be heard? Look for it. When can your words bless someone? When you can speak up where your woods would honor Jesus, where you could put in a good word for Jesus, when you can tell the gospel story or your story, how it's been changed by the gospel or the great things that God has done for you as Jesus sent that man off to his own hometown to do. Look for those events even this week. And when you speak, let it be full of grace and seasoned, praying that God will use your words, your response, your conversation for his glory. And we can't change people, can't change them or their perception of us, but instead of maybe trying to force them and push them and change them, how about this? Live at peace with them, if at all possible. Christians shouldn't be cantankerous. They should be peace-loving, peacemaking people. Romans 12, if it's all at all possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. We already read that. So look for the opportunities to influence somebody. Speak well. Speak up. Speak with love. By all means, speak the truth in love. Our our theme last year, which we carried over to this year, is on the banners. uh, Make a difference. Help. Serve. Love. Make a difference. Help. Serve. Love. And there is no greater thing you can do to help or serve or love than to tell someone about Jesus. to to make a disciple of them, to to be just one person in that person's life that God could use to change someone for his glory. On Wednesday nights, a little while back, we were going through a book by Vince Antonucci. I love the name and I love his book. The title is, I Became a Christian and All I Got Was This Lousy T-Shirt. It's not new now, it's old, but it's good. This man is an unlikely Christian, an unlikely minister, an unlikely church planner, but he became all of those, and he writes very well about about his adventure. And it's funny when he writes sometimes. But they worked their way into a new community, wanted to launch a new church. And I'm going to read quite a bit of what he said. You can read it for your own, but here's some of what he said. "I, I was standing outside in front of a group of people about to tell them about Jesus. We put flyers on the doors of about 5,000 houses, inviting people to a picnic to hear about the new church starting in their community. We prayed for 10 people 
to our amazement, 104 showed up. I shared my testimony and the vision for the new church, a church for people who didn't like church. Everyone seemed interested, he said, except for this one guy. He was a big guy with huge forearms. Just think of me on that. He leaned, he leaned against a tree. As I, as I spoke, his eyes were throwing daggers at me. Afterwards, I started walking around, greeting everyone, and I purposely avoided this dude, partly because I was temporarily without health insurance. Finally, I approached him and I said, hey, my name is Vince. My name is Dave, he said, and I hate church. He looked intense and his words were coated with venom. I thought, I'm going to get beat up at my own picnic. I started backing up slowly and asked, why do you hate church, Dave? Dave explained that he went to a church as a child, but when his parents divorced, the church told his mother not to come back. Years later, when he and his wife had their first child, they decided to give church another try. They walked in and sat down in a pew next to another family. The family looked Dave and his shoddily dressed family up and down and moved to a different pew. Dave finished his story, stared at me and growled, I really hate church. I wish that was the first or last time I heard something like that, but it's not, and it kills me. The gospel, he says, is the most beautiful thing imaginable. There is a perfect father who loves us so much, he'll forgive everything. In fact, he loves us so much, he was willing to have his son lay down his life so that he could forgive everything. And he goes on to tell about this incredible thing called the gospel. And he goes on to write later, somehow Christians have managed to make the good news sound like bad news. They've taken the luster off the gospel and made it something ugly. This is what we're working against, he says. Jesus called us to be bearers of the gospel. We're to be people known for living out his amazing grace. We're asked to take this precious idea, this beautiful life, and bring it wherever we go, holding it out for others to see, making it available to anyone interested. But instead, Christians have become bearers of gospel tracts featuring cartoon drawings of people in anguish as they smolder in hell. Christians have become known as those who are amazingly judgmental. The other night in my small group, one lady said that her boss told her when they receive a check with a scripture verse printed on it, nine times out of ten, the check is going to bounce. Another guy who works for an insurance company told us their fraud department, department claims the first sign of fraud is when you hear someone say, God bless you. Christians are despised by waitresses, he said, as those who leave the worst tips. In a world where somehow Christians, he says, have made the good news sound like bad news and have given a black eye to the gospel, we need to understand what we're up against. There are a lot of Daves who are not interested in buying what we're selling. So back to the story, he said, so I looked Dave in the eye and said, Dave, I don't blame you for hating church. And if I were you, I probably would never give church another chance, but it's not supposed to be that way. It isn't always that way. And our church won't be that way. I hope somehow you'll give us a chance. And Dave, listen, not everyone does it right, but life with God is really special. It's amazing, and I think it's what you want, what we all really want. Maybe it's not what you think it is, not what you've seen. Dave gave me another death stare, grunted, and walked away. He goes on to write that 89 people from that picnic started into their Bible studies where they studied the Bible together in their small groups, and Dave's wife at one point came to one of those groups, and a few weeks later, Dave came with her. So we pick up the story. He was reeking of pot. His eyes were glazed over. I don't think he said a word the entire night, but he started showing up at first occasionally and then more and more regularly. He came with us when we served the homeless. He watched his people's lives were changed. He listened as they encountered, or sorry, as they encouraged and prayed for each other. Slowly, he began engaging the Bible and other people in the group. And a year later, Dave gave his life to Jesus. He was baptized. He couldn't help it. He had been exposed to the gospel that is truly beautiful, to the good news which is really good news, to life in the kingdom. How could he say no to that? Vince has a lot more to say in the chapter. But in the end, he says this. Four years into our church, we experienced our first death. One of the core couples in our church lost their teenage daughter in a car accident the night before Easter. 
I had to announce it. And after I, I did, our Easter service became more of a funeral service. The next morning, the girl's father woke up early at home and was unable to go back to sleep. He walked down to his living room about 5.30 a.m. He grabbed his Bible and sat on the couch. And as he did, he noticed something in his backyard. In the darkness, it looked like a large lump on the ground. He squinted and realized it was a person. Eventually, he realized it was Dave, the guy I thought was going to beat me up at the picnic. Dave was on his knees praying for the family. Who knows how or when Dave had arrived or how long he'd been there, but he stayed for quite a while praying for this family. Can God change a person's heart and turn their life upside down and rearrange everything? Yes, of course. Can God take someone who hates the church and all of the Christians and turn them into a Christian? who loves the church and works for God's glory, yes, of course he can. I give you two test cases, Dave and the Apostle Paul. Who knows what God will do through you this week? Who knows how he might work in the lives of Christians this week? Maybe the world will hate us. Maybe some always will. But if the love of God can change us, then maybe. Just maybe it could change others. If we just hold out the message of hope and speak of the Lord's goodness and tell the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere we can. This week, I want to send you out with the words we started with, a little bit more, but let me read it to you so you walk out this door with this verse in mind. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it's mine to avenge. I'll repay, says the Lord. No, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing so, you'll heap burning coals on the head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. And this week, if there is even a chance that in all the hatred you would be overcome by evil, no, let's overcome evil with good. Let's stand and sing.